so uh, our last speaker today uh, will be uh, Baron Sternfels, and he'll talk about Wasserstein distance to independence models. Yeah, thank you very much. So now for something different, I'd like to tell you about the paper with this title. There are four co-authors, co uh, two in red, Turku and Lorenzo were postdocs at the Max Planck Institute at that time. Asga and Guido in blue um, are colleagues at based at UCLA. Guido in particular is an expert in, in machine learning. Let's look at the picture for a second. So the picture shows us the different ways in which a cube can touch a sphere, right? So a three cube can touch a sphere either along a facet, that's six possibilities for that to happen, or at a vertex, the eight possibilities for that to happen, or along an edge. They can be tangent and there are 12 possibilities for that to happen. And this is the cartoon. I like you to keep it in the back of your mind as the, the talk goes on. Let me define the Wasserstein distance or earth movers distance. We're starting with a symmetric n by n matrix that represents a finite metric space. So the entries are non-negative and satisfy the triangle inequality. And the underlying set bracket n is the first n positive integer. So we've turned this into a metric space. We're fixing a finite metric space on n elements. Let's also look at the simplex of dimension n minus one, which is the set of all probability distributions on that same finite set. So the distributions on that phase finite set is the standard n minus one dimensional simplex. And I would like to lift the finite metric space to a metric space structure on the simplex. So we have a metric space structure on the vertices of our simplex and we'd like to define using this a metric space structure on the simplex. And in the Wasserstein sense, this is done by solving a linear programming problem. So given two probability distributions, two points on our simplex, mu and nu, then we're calculating the distance by maximizing uh, this linear expression where the xi are the unknowns um, here, the finite metric enters the uh, description. So xij minus xj in absolute value is bounded by dij. And uh, so this gives us a positive number. And it turns out that this also now satisfies the triangle inequality. So we've taken our discrete finite metric space and turned it into a continuous metric space on the simplex. And this is known as the Wasserstein distance between mu and nu. So there's a vast literature on this, mostly on the analytic side and also in machine learning on optimal transfer and earth movers. And here I'm focusing on the discrete case, although some of the ideas will also extend to, to continuous settings. So this is the Wasserstein distance on a simplex induced from a finite metric. Now the unit ball of the Wasserstein distance is a polytope. So everything here is a polyhedral. So I'm gonna write EI for the ith standard basis vector. EI minus EJ is the difference of these uh, root of in, in the root system AN. And I scale it by one over DIJ and the convex cell of those uh, scaled root vectors is a convex polytope I'll call capital B. And this is the unit ball in the metric I just defined. The polar dual of the polytope uh, is exactly the uh, given by the constraints that we used in our linear program. So recall in our linear program, we optimize the linear function over these constraints and the set of all X that satisfy these constraints is the dual to the unit ball. There's a little bit of fine print here. Uh, the way I've written this, this would be unbounded, but to make it bounded and compact, we're quotienting out by the line spanned by the all one vector as is customary in tropical geometry. Now this B dual um, comes up in many, many contexts. So in the Wasserstein context, uh, it's called a Lipschitz polytope for obvious reasons. 
Uh, in tropical geometry, these are special examples of tropical polytopes, so-called polytropes. So a polytrope is uh, an object that both classically convex and tropically convex. And in, in algebraic combinatorics and representation theory, these things are called alcove polytopes of type A. So, so these polytopes, B dual, come up in many, many contexts. And we're interested in the B. These are the unit balls of our metric. So again, we're starting from a finite metric space and we're turning it into a metric, a continuous metric space on the simplex. And this is the ball and the dual to the ball. So let me go back to very boring classical statistics on finitely many states. So suppose I have a high dimensional probability simplex then a model will be any red subset. So I have a small low dimensional red subset. So by a model, I'll simply mean a subset of the simplex and statistics. This comes often as the image of a, a parametric representation. So I have a parameter space and an unknown true parameter, maybe theta. And that maps to the uh, unknown, maybe true distribution, which lies in the model. Now we're taking some data. The empirical distribution is a point in that high dimensional simplex. And in the classical frequentist context, we're seeking to minimize a certain data, a distance from the data point to the, uh, to the model. And this is often called maximum likelihood estimation. So this figure comes from a, a book called uh, Algebraic Statistics for Computational Biology. Now the issue is, um, what is the model and how should you calculate the distance? Well, we will assume here in this talk that the model is compact and defined by polynomials. So it's a variety intersected with the simplex. Uh, a priori, it could be any set. And uh, how do we measure distance? Well, we certainly don't take the Euclidean distance. So in classical statistics, you would take the kohlberg leibler distance, but uh, here, and that's the talk, we'll use the Wasserstein distance. So we're defining the Wasserstein distance from uh, our empirical distribution mu to the model M to be simply the shortest distance. So there's the minimum of all points nu in the model to the data mu. And then uh, we've expressed this earlier as solving our linear program over the, uh, the polytrope, over the, the dual polytope B dual. Now computing this means solving a non-convex optimization problem. So there's an interesting combinatorial, uh, interesting optimization problem. So I will tell you about the basic geometry, the basic math of this problem. I will not talk about methodologies, let alone deep learning methodologies for solving this, but I think this would be very interesting to, to combine that with some of the ideas in the previous talks today. I will talk about the basic geometry of this problem. Now, independence models was also in the title. So what is an independence model? Well, the simplest independence model is the independence model for two binary random variables. So suppose you have two binary random variables and uh, with unknown probabilities P and Q, so maybe you take a sample of a thousand people and uh, let's pretend that gender is a, a binary random variable with two states, male and female. And then uh, maybe you have a, a second random variable uh, between maybe you, um, height, right? Somebody is either tall or short. So with probability P, a random person will be male, one minus P female, Q tall, one minus Q short then uh, the joint distribution is given by these four numbers that sum to one. And then geometrically, the model is this quadratic surface, the Segre variety inside the probability tetrahedron. So there are four states, female tall, female short, male tall, male short. And then the independence, if these two things were independent, we would be exactly on the surface. Uh, if they're not, we're off, right? Positively or negatively correlated. So in general, in independence models refer to matrices or tensors uh, of rank one. 
mixture, so higher rank. So here is a, a little three by three by three tensor. Um, the color coding shows it's a symmetric tensor. So a three by three by three symmetric tensor has 10 uh, distinct entries uh, here indicated by the color coding. So again, we have a high dimensional uh, simplex and then a low dimensional red model, which we think of as an algebraic variety. And the models we're primarily be concerned with here are the Segre varieties of the rank one matrices or tensors, symmetric or general. Okay, so I like to work out an explicit solution to our optimization problem, our distance to independence, Wasserstein distance to independence model in some small cases. But maybe I can pause here before I go get to that. Let me pause and see whether the, the setup uh, is clear. Are there any questions at this point? I cannot see the chat. So I can ask a question. Uh -huh. um, so on the previous slide, there was this brackets. So what is this? How is it defined? Oh, this one? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is just the inner product. So, so mu minus nu is your friend. In a product from the ambient space of the simplex. Or exactly. This is just a dot product. So this is just the, the, the usual dot product between two vectors of length n. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And, and the way, you know, you can see here, I take mu minus nu. So they're distributions. So, so this difference is a vector whose coordinates sum to zero. And therefore, the inner product with x is well defined even though we're working here in this quotient space. So I sneakily use this quotient space here uh, since I'm taking the distance the difference between just two distributions. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions? It's clear what we're doing. So this is the optimization problem we want to solve. We want to find a formula in terms of the data mu and maybe the underlying finite metric space for the Wasserstein distance to independence, the earth movers distance to independence. Well, then let me give you the solution for this model. So I'm gonna give you the explicit formula now. You have, you're starting with a finite metric on the four vertices of the tetrahedron. Let's say the four vertices are A, C, G, and T, if you like biology. So we have a four point metric space. We have a data point somewhere out here. The empirical distribution, if we ask uh, a thousand people, whether they're male or female or tall or short, and then we can calculate the distance as follows. So the finite metric I'm gonna take is the Hamming, the obvious Hamming distance. So this uh, is the matrix. So I have my state space, the binary pairs. So this is the four element set, uh, male tall, male short, female tall, female short. This is the natural distance among these four states. And then we're given a, uh, an empirical distribution mu. So mu is a point in the tetrahedron delta three. And then the, uh, the Wasserstein distance is given by the following expression. So the expression has 12 cases. It looks like eight, but there are 12 cases. And in each case, the solution is given by an algebraic function, right? So this is a, an expression that involves, in each case, we have an expression that involves the uh, square root in this case. So it's an algebraic function of degree two. Now here you see the absolute value and the absolute value is either, you know, that expression or the, uh, the negative of that. So, so this is really two different cases. So altogether there are four plus four plus four, 12 different cases. These cases are given by a semi-algebraic stratification. So I'm chopping up the uh, tetrahedron into 12 pieces. And on each piece, the optimal solution is given here by an algebraic function of degree two or down here by a rational expression that is to say an algebraic function of degree one. Let's make it even easier. Let's take the uh, the uh, symmetric two by two matrices of rank one. So our two random variables are now uh, IID, right? So let's assume we have an IID situation. And in this case, the, uh, the model is called the Hardy-Weinberg curve of classical genetics. 
So now we have a probability triangle. The simplex becomes a triangle. Here's again the formula for the Wasserstein distance to the model. And uh, here we're given an algebraic expression. There are five cases and five because again, we have twice the absolute value. So here very explicitly, the tetrahedron is carved up into five regions. And then on each region, we are given the uh, distance to the red model in the Wasserstein sense explicitly uh, in this formula. So this is the paradigm, right? Obviously, these kind of explicit formulas can only be derived in, in very, very small scenarios. But this is the overall structure by which we would like to represent the solution to our optimization problem. So let's talk about the structure and complexity of our optimization problem. So there's the optimal value function. So the optimal value function takes the data, the data distribution, the empirical distribution and finds the shortest distance, that's a number. The solution function is the best distribution in the model, right? So there's the both the distance and then there's the map to the estimated true dis distribution in the model. So these are piecewise algebraic functions. And this suggests a division of our problem into two tasks. First in blue, identify all pieces, right? So we have this high dimensional simplex and we like to somehow identify all five or 12 pieces somehow in some semi-algebraic description. And then second in purple, find a formula, an algebraic formula for each piece. So here again, there are five pieces that we identified by these inequalities. And then we have a formula on each piece. Now, both of these tasks have a high degree of complexity. And I like to separate out this complexity into two pieces. The first task, the blue task, pertains to combinatorial complexity. So what are the possible regions that there are? What are sort of the combinatorics of the regions? How many are there? And the second task is an algebraic complexity. What is the algebraic degree of the true answer? So here the algebraic degree is two. There is a, we need to solve a quadratic equation. Those of us who have paid attention in high school uh, maybe memorized the formula for doing so. So this is an algebraic function of degree two. In general, we're interested in the algebraic degree of the coordinates of the true solution over the field that specifies the instances, typically rational numbers. Which brings us back to our cube touching the sphere, right? So this is in fact uh, an example of this. So think about, uh, think about the model, the, the green sphere as a cartoon for our statistical model and think about the cube as the unit ball, right? We're talking about polyhedral, norm, polyhedral norms here. So the, uh, the unit ball is the cube here. So the question is we want to find the closest point from a little green data point to the model in the given polyhedral norm, right? So, so green, that's the model, the statistical model. Here, this is the empirical distribution here, here, or here. How do you find the closest point from the closest distance, shortest distance from the little green measured dot to the uh, model, which is the sphere? Well, you need to find exactly the points of tangency, right? There are altogether six plus eight plus 12 combinatorial possibilities. So the combinatorial complexity says, how many faces does the unit ball have, right? The, the unit ball has eight zero dimensional faces describing these scenarios. It has 12 one dimensional faces describing these scenarios. And finally, it has six two dimensional faces describing these scenarios. For each of these scenarios, for each of these 26 faces of the three-dimensional cube, we now need to solve an algebraic geometry problem, namely to determine the degree of the critical variety. We need to determine how many complex critical points does the 
distance function have on this stratum where a given combinatorial situation is attained. Again, let me pause. Is it clear what this cartoon says? So I'm trying to find the closest point on the sphere from a little green data point with respect to the polyhedral norm whose unit ball is the three cube. Any question about that? Um, Very good, then let's do it in general. I have a and question, Barry. Yes, question. Um, so in this case, what is the degree of the critical? Uh, the degree is either one or two. So in this case, so you need to solve, you know, and uh, you need to solve a, a system of equations. So you can take this little picture and translate it into a system of equations. And, and in this case, the scenario is just like here. You either have a degree one, the rational Wasserstein L MLE or a quadratic you know, extension for the MLE. Thank you. I'll give a, a general formula in, in a moment. But before going to this degree, so this is a, the first question is an interesting question. So the blue question is a question of combinatorics. So there's blue combinatorics and then there is a purple algebraic geometry. So let me talk about the blue combinatorics first and then uh, switch to the purple algebraic geometry. Okay, so we have these polytopes. So we want to know the numbers of their faces, their F factors. And uh, we have a couple results about this also in the paper. Let me assume that the given finite metric space is a graph metric on a graph with vertex set n. This is very, very natural, right? Because these are the basic states. So for example, the, in, the, in the male, female, tall, short example, we had the Hemming distance. So it's very, very natural to assume that the underlying finite metric space has a graph structure and that the given finite metric is given by the graph distance on this graph. If that is so, then the, uh, the Lipschitz polytope, the dual to the unit ball, this is the polytrope, um, has the following uh, description. So uh, xi minus xj is at most one, and all we need is to look at the edges. So it suffices to look at the edges of the graph and uh, we have these Lipschitz inequalities. We're just saying that adjacent vertices in the graph have distance at most one. And the Wasserstein distance is computed by solving the linear program over this B star. If the graph happens to be bipartite, as is the case of independence, uh, these are in fact the facet defining inequalities. So for example, if the graph is the hypercube of dimension K, that's a bipartite graph, right? So the bipartite hypercube, then the vertices have a combinatorial description. So they are in bijection with the proper three colorings of that graph with one vertex of a fixed color. And then of course, these things grow exponentially as things do in the world. So the number of such colorings, that is to say the number of vertices is 6, 30, 38, 990, and so on. So on the six cube, uh, this is the number, okay? So we computed these unit balls for small independence models and their combinatorics, their blue combinatorics is an interesting research direction in its own right. So the study of the unit balls of the uh, Wasserstein metrics is an interesting topic uh, of combinatorics and it helps guide us understand the uh, combinatorial complexity. And of course, you can estimate the asymptotics and then you can do a lot of interesting combinatorics with this. This, however, is a meeting in algebraic geometry, algebraic geometry and machine learning. So let me talk a little bit about the purple algebraic geometry. So again, what are we doing? There is a, a blue combinatorics problem and a purple algebraic geometry problem that separates out, very important, the combinatorial complexity of the problem and the algebraic complexity of the problem. So let's assume that the model, our compact model is smooth. For simplicity, let me assume M is smooth. Let little l be a linear functional 
and capital L an affine space of dimension R, both in general position relative to the model. So then we have the following theorem. It says the polar degree delta R of the model is the algebraic degree of the following optimization problem. So the red optimization problem is minimize the linear functional L over the intersection of our model with the linear space. Now there are two ways to think about this theorem, right? If you know what polar degrees are, so polar degrees are certain um, invariants of, uh, of an algebraic variety, a projective variety coming from uh, numerative geometry. If you know what polar degrees are, then this is a theorem. If you don't know what polar degrees are, then this is a definition. So maybe many of you do not know the definition of, po the, the definition of polar degrees in terms of intersection theory, then you can use this optimization definition, right? So the polar degrees, uh, the rth polar degree of a variety here in its compact guise is a number, is the number of complex critical points of the following optimization problem, slice the model with an R-dimensional space and then minimize a linear functional over this. So again, this is either a theorem if you know what a polar degree is or it's a definition if you don't. Now, recent work of Luca Sodomaco, a former student of Giorgio Ottaviano, Ottaviani gives a, a very nice, complicated but explicit formula for polar degrees of, of all Segre Veronese varieties. So Segre Veronese varieties are the algebraic geometric versions of the independence models they were discussing here. So for example, for P1 to the K, so this is the uh, <clears throat> independence model for K binary random variables, we get, uh, this is the kind of formula one gets. So the R minus first, uh, polar degree, which is this algebraic complexity for k-bit independence is this expression. So it's an expression, it's an alternating sum. It's an explicit formula in terms of k and r, right? So be, behind all that, you know, lies chow rings, intersection theory, say gray glasses and all that. Um, but the point here is that uh, say gray class, uh, excuse me, polar degrees measure the algebraic complexity of intersecting the model and then maximizing a linear functional over this model. Now, this is, of course, now where we get to precisely this situation, right? So algebraic geometry now meets numerical mathematics. So the R, so this is the model. And then the R uh, tells us, you know, is the driven, which choice of R we're using is driven by the blue combinatorial complexity, right? So the, the cube, the unit ball, decides what dimension face will touch the model as the unit ball grows and touches for the first time. And that gives us to answer Carlos question. I think this was Carlos, uh, the question, which R we should use and which polar degree we should take. So here's an example. So let's take the uh, independence model for two random variables with M1 states and M2 states. So so these are uh, M1 by M2 contingency tables of rank one independent tables. Here's the, uh, the M1 and M2. So for example, if you take a three by three matrix, so two ternary random variables, uh, then the relevant values of R are zero, one, two, three, and four. And then uh, this will tell you the algebraic uh, degree. So it's 6, 12, 12, 6, 3. So down here, you can solve in radicals by Cardano's formula, a little harder to memorize. And here, the Galois group will typically not be solvable. Right? So this is how this is interpreted. So the combinatorial structure tells you which row you're in. And then uh, that row tells you the algebraic complexity for a given model for computing that point. So we did lots of experiments for interesting uh, independence models. We were interested to see the, the empirical distribution of which R is, is attained. 
So, uh, so here we have various independence models. So this is, you know, three binary random variables. So this is three binary random variables, uh, IID. So this is two by two by two tensors. This would be a symmetric two by two by two tensors. And then there's an underlying finite metric space on the states. And uh, so there's L1, or L0. So these are different kinds of natural metrics that have been used in the machine learning context and on these finite state spaces. Here is the F vector, the face numbers of the unit ball in this case. So this is the uh, sort of combinatorial complexity. And then here we have the empirical distribution of how many optimal solutions are attained at uh, various uh, faces, at various dimensions of the faces of the unit ball. So, and then uh, this will tell you with, together with the previous table, uh, what you can expect in terms of algebraic complexity in, in solving these problems. Okay, so uh, it's been a long day. It's in the middle of a, a long, intensive and very inspiring week. Nobody minds if a math talk ends early. So that's what we'll do. So in my lecture, classical statistics uh, and optimization came together with algebraic geometry. There was a lot of interesting combinatorial structure and the construct combinatorial structure comes from the metric itself. So in the optimal transport Wasserstein setting, the, the metric spaces and the unit balls are very interesting. And uh, this also leads to cool opportunities for algebraic combinatorics. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Bernd. So we have uh, time for questions, if there are more. Can I ask mm. a question? Sure, Jose. Uh, so you had this general lin uh, general uh, linear function, Bernd. Is there any special cases that you're interested in where it's a not in general position? Yes, of course. So, so the linear function, this is the, the uh, this L will come from a face, the affine span of some face of the unit ball. So both the little L and the big L come from the description of the polytope, and they, of course, will be very special, right? So, so these bounds are simply upper bounds. So as, as very often in algebraic geometry, so these are going to be upper bounds. In the application, uh, typically the degrees are lower, right? Because the specific linear spaces come from the uh, the facial structure of the unit ball, which is particular in this case. These are polytropes; they're highly structured. Hey, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, so, thank you for answering my question before. Uh, so, in the table that you have. I was uh, curious to see some like symmetry in the first columns and then it was lost. Like, can, do you have an explanation for that? Uh, yeah, so no, we haven't looked at this more closely, but this is interesting, right? So these are certain, uh, these are polar degrees. And uh, so if, if you have varieties that are self-dual, so for example, the first one, the first one is a self-dual uh, Segre varieties, then you have immediate symmetry for obvious geometric reasons. So I think we'll probably, that's probably what we're seeing here with these uh, Segre varieties, we're seeing sort of shadows of self duality. So Jose is very familiar with this uh, in, in the context of uh, Kohlbeck Leibler, classical MLE, but I think we're seeing shadows of, of self duality of certain small Segre varieties. I also had a question. Can I ask my question? Sure, go ahead, sir. Um, so does it make sense to optimize the, the, the DIJs? So I, does it make sense to ask the question, should, you know, which DIJ should I pick so that things, the, the complexity is, is go, goes down? Um, uh, I think so. I think it's a good math question. I, now, in terms of the application, I'm not so sure. So yeah. as I said, this was DIJ inspired. Montefar, who's a machine learner. So, so I think in, in the applications, typically the finite metric space is given. Fixed, yeah. But hey, this is interesting math. I completely agree with you. I think varying uh, over the finite metric space could be very interesting. Thanks. <laughs>